advice on finance? With clear periods, perhaps a rather misty later on in the article. Yes, sir. Independent Radio News at 8, Nicky Arbus. The phone in that doesn't leave a stone unturned. The body of a young woman found cut up at the bottom of the... Sandwiches together with chopped hard-boiled egg and water. Eight, it's now eight and a half minutes to eight. Four eighty four fifty two five five zero oh one nine three five two one four one two six one one nine four. I mean, there's only one absolutely 100% foolproof method of contraception. That's a rhythmical movement of the head from left to right, indicating no. Yes. Um, what's the position regarding the male pill? Is this still being developed? It is still being developed. Would you like to get to your problem? Because you don't think you've had it solved, and I think you're taking an unconscionable amount of air time to air your peculiarities and your fixations and not your difficulties. Oh. Yes. Oh. Just cram your finger in the jar. Just cram your finger in the jar. Finger in the jar. Whether we like it or not, other people's problems are an expanding part of the entertainment industry. One recent survey reveals nearly 300 programs on radio and television that exist solely to generate social action. Many of these are phone-ins, offering advice on anything from bestiality to getting the local council to do repairs. The range is enormous. Uh, uh, I'm You're next. Hello, folks. Just joined us. Good evening. I'm Adrian Love. Wednesday night. He's my regular guest, Anna Rayburn. Every Wednesday on Adrian Love's Open Line, journalist Anna Rayburn and the Capital Doctor try to help Londoners with their emotional, sexual, and personal problems. Well, I mean, suicidal thoughts are very common, you know, in people who've had mental illness for a long time. Yeah, I understand that. And it sounds as if she's, she gets catastrophically depressed from time to time. And in a situation like that, you are quite right. You do take tablets away. How, how long has she been taking the drugs, John? Oh, 10 years. And, I mean, is that, is, have you been, how long has you been had? Uh, not long. Other people's problems may make good radio, but how effective is on-air counselling? The counsellor would appear to me to be a contradiction in terms. You cannot counsel an abstraction. People present what they want you to hear. They only tell you that much of the story. Some of them may be tremendously honest. Some of them won't be honest at all. Some of them will censor very heavily what they tell you. You can't possibly counsel if you haven't seen somebody. You don't see their body language. You don't see them in different moods. You don't see them over a protracted period of time. So what you have is an impression. And it seems to me the most honest thing you can do with that impression is to turn it round and respond as fast and as hard and as truthfully as you can. That's what I do. Hello, Pat. Hello. Um, Patrick Kenner. Yes. Um, I have got this obsession, uh, sexual obsession, um, with uh, animals. I don't know how, how to put it. I, I feel highly stimulated by animals. What sort of animals? Uh, dogs. Mm-hmm. You could tell about it? Uh, I have intercourse with a Things shake us. Sometimes a call will come in and you can, I can look around the studio and it's wonderful because you can see the eyes. All the eyes go together because it is a team. Uh, but if we suddenly go, <gasps> do you make love to a dumb man? And he's going to feel awful. The audience is going to feel awful. And we're not going to do any good for anybody. On the phone, Charles. Hello, Charles. I, I phoned you last week, actually. Yes. I was, uh, I was phoning about uh, too much sex drive, really. Um, we didn't really get a satisfactory solution to what I suggested anyway, and it's all linked to other problems as well, so I'd really like to have it out tonight, you know. Well, if you come back for a second measure, you'd better sound off and we'll do our best. Uh, one of the things I'm worried about, you know, when I'm with somebody, of course, is the fear of pregnancy. I have been considering vasectomy. Why should you be considering vasectomy? Have you ever fathered any children? I've got two children, yes. Do you want any more? Well, this is it. I mean, at the moment, I think no, but you never know, do you? Well, then, you're not a candidate for vasectomy, are you? So it would seem that the answer is either that the women that you're with use some form of birth control, or else that you invest in a packet of dear old Durex and get on with it. I don't believe in babying people. And I think that what it very often happens is that, particularly in the spoken media, everybody's so darn afraid of giving evidence of themselves that they soft pedal and soft pedal, where in fact having something, giving that person something to kick against, having something to say in words of one syllable very concisely, is actually a very good way of killing that call, getting it off air, and saying, okay, let's do something else, because this person is going to ramble, 
25 minutes, 35 minutes, 2 hours and 20 minutes, and you're not going to get anywhere. So kill it to go. I don't really see that much answer. Well, what do you think is the answer? You seem to think you have an answer that is better than the answer I gave you. What is it? To ask to control your emotion is the answer. Then you'd better go and talk to your doctor and see if he will refer you to a psychiatrist, and it will be in their hands, and frankly, I think they're better judges than you are. Capital, 22 minutes. I think it's fast, it has to be, because this is radio and we have an audience who want to listen to us as well as a group of people who want to talk to us about various problems. As far as how fast we talk and how slick we are about talking, we wouldn't be hired if we couldn't do that. And there were some appalling radio phone-ins early on in both Capital's history and in um, LBC's. When we had the Air Rum Brigade in, and they sure talked slower and they sure weren't glib and they sure as hell were boring. The presenter of this weekly phone-in programme is a local vicar, Ian Gatford. He and his three guests let the caller's problems dictate the pace. Good morning, this is Ian Gatford for this week's edition of Who Cares? And with me in the studio this morning... Okay, that's Now, if you just hang on to the phone, Ian. I'll send the programme down the telephone to you, and in a few moments, Ian will introduce you as Ken of Lenten, okay? Okay, you'll have to hold the line with you very shortly. Now, let's call from Ken of Lenten. Ken of Lenten. Well, now let's look at the whole of this thing. Um, Peter Smithy, you've done a lot on DHSS law and things like that, and um, this seems to me to be right up your street. As a clergyman, I think sometimes we can get much too involved in the local church and, and consider that to be our world, and that's a terribly dangerous thing to do. I believe the church exists for this world, and um, the, the, the questions which people are, rise, are raising on who cares are the things which really are concerning them. And sometimes as a church, we tend to go to them with what we think they ought to be thinking about instead of saying, what is it that's worrying you? They feel they can ring up the programme because they know Ian Gatford. Um, they talk, ring us up all week and say, you know, I feel I can talk to you, you're a friend, I, I know about you and I know who you are. And they have confidence in us because the station has a presence in this area and it has uh, trust and has integrity and people will respond to that and in some cases we have to stop them telling us um, great personal details but for some reason they feel that they can talk to us and we're on their side, we're not part of the establishment of them. It was just a, it was just a waste of time. John, um, in your department there having been, um, the Mrs. Mrs. Russell says it was a complete waste of time, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I don't accept, obviously, what uh, Mrs. Russell says. And the only thing that I can say at the moment is that someone will be around there today to examine these complaints that Mrs. Russell is talking about. Now, can she tell me whether or not there will be, the, the, it will be possible to get into the house today? Mrs. Yeah. Russell, will it be possible to get in there today? Some think that I'd do a darn sight better going around and knocking on doors. And that, so, you know, if I didn't waste my time doing this, I could actually be and in people's homes. Um, but the whole range of answers is there. You know, I've had people very recently say um, that the feeling is that the program gives us all a chance as, as church people to hear, well, uh, not as church people, as human beings, to hear other people's suffering and other people's concerns and anxieties. And some of them do see this as a very real part of you know, the church is caring for the world and drawing out this sort of concern, the, um, this anxiety. Let's call from Doris of the city. Uh, she's got a friend who's very lonely and depressed. It might just be that she's the one who's going to pay on it. And now we're going to take a call from uh, the city and we're going to talk to you, Doris. Good morning. Hi. What have you got, dear? Do you very upset yourself, or are you phoning about someone else who's upset? Yeah. You, is it a problem you've got, or is it um, somebody else you want to talk about? Well, it's, it's a problem that she's got, you know, she just seems as though she, she can't cope, you know. This is a everything. friend of yours, is it? Yeah. Uh, well, everything's too much trouble for her, you know. She's all tense up, you know. Mm. But does this, does this, uh, I mean, obviously you know this person very well, does this stop her going out? Does she find herself stuck at home most of the day, worried about going out, worried about seeing people? Yes, that's a problem. That's, that's a problem. And if she 
on her own in the dirt. Yeah. yeah. No family. Well, the family is grown up. Yeah. It's very intimate. Uh, you know, we are in somebody's living room. It's just them by themselves. We've got to remember that. And they've found a way of talking to someone who they believe will listen to them. It's our job to make them feel there are people around who care. It's not our job to answer it in a few minutes on the air. What's the problem with that? Is she... Is, she is, it, is it something there? Yes. It is. is it something you would rather not I talk about? I thought it was um, no. all confidential, you know. Well, you, nobody knows who you are, and nobody... Knew, you know, we, we can talk to you afterwards off the air if there's something you want to go into at, deeper, at a deeper level. I think perhaps we have to watch constantly of trying to find a happy medium between people saying enough about themselves for us to be able to guide them to the right place and not saying too much such that you know they, they suddenly find that they've given away things about themselves that they didn't know lots of people were listening to. At the same time, I'm conscious that if they give enough about themselves, other people can identify with that and that encourages other people to come forward with problems. Um, what we're saying is, we can't do it this moment. Well, yeah, I wondered if I could come down to the, you know, I've got to go out in about half an hour. Well, yeah, well I think about I... Ten, ten o'clock time. Well, we can make a link, can't we, later in the day? I think if you can try and ring in after, the, after you get back from shopping, Doris, I shall be in the office. We, we spend a long time on the particular day, on the morning of the programme, following up calls which need immediate help, linking people up together, and very often follow-up goes on all through the week. Want to ring us, ring now, please, on 44444, all the way through the news. We're here right up until half past ten. See you in just a few seconds' time. Following through the problems uncovered in a programme like Who Cares is a big task. Capital Radio was spending so much time following up calls for help and answering general inquiries from the public, they created Helpline, an off-air telephone advice service. I see. You, he's, he's, he's over in this country. Yeah. It's got to get a court order, yes. They can't just go around and start flinging stuff around. We just have the addresses of the various um, exchanges. Now, has she, has she gone back to the council and asked them why they're deducting this amount? There's a great need in a city such as London for a signposting service. We can talk to people about their problems and put them in direct touch with the appropriate agency to help them. I think they come to us because they have a fear of going into government departments or possibly meeting with the bureaucracy or red tape. And I think certainly capital has a very friendly image and people identify very strongly with the radio station. Michael has it's 13 minutes to 11 minutes of Thursday morning and that means, as usual, it's a helpline special day on Capital Radio. The subject this week is gambling. To most of us, of course, a, a harmless occasional flutter, but to some, a, a terrible compulsion which eats away all the family's income. But uh, never fear, help is at hand in the form of an organisation called Gamblers Anonymous. And Anita is secretary to uh, that organisation. How did you first become involved in this, Anita? Well, I'm a compulsive gambler myself. Um, I c went to GA because I'd reached my own low. And GA is the most... It's difficult to judge how special days they go. Some are incredibly busy right from the word go. Others, it's a steady trickle of calls right the way through the day. And it looks as if this one here is going to build up slowly until between five and seven when it's likely to be very busy. Shall I give you the Harrow address? Do you, look, do you think you find how easy if you stop gambling, okay. you're never ever going to lose again? Okay, bye-bye. Of course it's, it's, not, it's not easy. And talking about helpline, today's was compulsive gambling, and I have Anita here who's been answering calls all day. Anita's from Gamblers Anonymous and is herself a compulsive gambler. Anita, how has today gone? Well, I'm absolutely delighted. We've had a tremendous response. And GA has worked. By opening up radio to listeners and their problems, phobias and fixations, the broadcaster assumes the role of social worker. So how do social workers themselves react to this kind of phone-in? Um, I think there's a, a degree of scepticism about them, for sure. Um, but on balance, 
it's um, given that it's been a tremendous growth industry, I don't think social workers can avoid them. And um, they certainly ought to be taking them seriously, um, both in terms of responding to people who put in touch with them as a result of a phone-in program, and also, I think, um, being very ready to give constructive criticism of where they feel the program has, has fallen down and perhaps can be remedied and improved. Get ready! Get set! Go! It's not easy to sprint when you're blind, but with guidance, it's possible. You can even play cricket. The Jubilee Club for the Visually Handicapped don't believe in mere blindness stopping them from enjoying life. But they do need voluntary help. So they approach Thames Television, whose regional help program can find hundreds of volunteers overnight. Joan Shenton is the presenter. Over the years, as a news reporter, I was usually sent on stories where there were areas of need. And I would come back and we'd do the story and say, isn't it terrible? Look what's happening. But the good thing about working on the help program is that one can go out, find areas of need, come back and shed light on them, and say, and this is what you can do about it. So it's sort of, it's more constructive. Oh, we're going to Do you want to come on the floor? Well, have you practiced? I mean, you can do it, right? Even cycling's possible, if you've got someone to steer for you. <laughs> I heard about this program uh, quite a number of months ago. People have said, why didn't you get the Jubilee Visually Handicapped Social Club into this program? And I said, oh, it's a very good idea, but I never had enough time. Yeah, I wrote into uh, Simon Buxton, the producer, and then he wrote back and said that he was very interested to come down and do a feature on the club's sporting and social activities. We always get a response. The numbers are irrelevant. In a sense, an enormous response is good, but a tiny response of five people that can help on a small project is just as valuable. Well, we hope that uh, we get uh, volunteers to help with um, transporting, uh, particularly for our minibus and the cars. We're always in uh, need of car drivers. We've got so many jobs that need doing at the Jubilee Club. As the programme goes on the air, a team of community service volunteers wait to deal with the inevitable flood of calls. There really are so many ways in which you could help the Jubilee Visually Handicapped Social Club. So if you feel you can help, we're waiting for your call on 01388 2345. Hi. And your address? Yeah, can we have your phone number? Good evening. Hello, help there, Brian. Hello. Initially, 230 people responded to the appeal. But six months later, how many of these remain? Unfortunately, it's sad to say that um, you lose a very, very high percentage of volunteers. Uh, we have, I should say, about 70 volunteers that are doing something in some way from a distance, but the actual hardcore comes down to only about 12 or 20 people, um, which is a little bit disappointing and we obviously need a lot more help still. We hit a jackpot with our appeal for kidney patients. Children under 15 and adults over 45 are usually allowed to die in this country for want of dialysis machines and stuff your foreign holiday change turned into a money-spinning lifesaver. Reports Action started as a regional program in the Northwest. Like the Thames Help Program, it recruits helpers for voluntary organizations. A 
team from Leicester University researched the results of those early programs. They discovered that 70% of the volunteers had dropped out at an early stage. Why was this? Well, I think a variety of reasons. Um, one seems to be that uh, the, a small proportion of people having contacted the program then decided, well, you know, it isn't really for me after all. And a bigger proportion, once they found out more about what was involved, decided, well, no, I can't afford that kind of time commitment. I can't see myself sticking a, a, a two-year course, which, it, which might be needed. Um, and in, in some senses, you, you might say that the, the level of information that the program got across was possibly not quite enough for the volunteers really to make up their minds before they picked up the telephone and, and went on. Both Thames and Granada work very closely with the Community Service Volunteer Organisation. Here in Manchester, Granada's production personnel share an office with the CSV team who deal with calls from the public and open the mountains of mail which arrive every day. But cooperation doesn't stop there. Even the programmes are planned jointly with the CSB. But it won't have any kind of political content. I mean, how do we get the pressure? The, the right. government is made to put pressure on the government. Right. Well, I suppose we're going to play a piggy in the middle role. Um, it's to work with the production team in trying to make sure that the force action is achieving its maximum potential in terms of getting across the message which voluntary organisations want to do. And it's working with the voluntary organisation to make sure that having got the message across, that the organisation is ready and geared to cope with the response so the goodwill which the programme generates actually results in action afterwards. Some voluntary agencies feel that not enough backup help is given to the organisations who take part in the programmes. What happens? Um, you feature an, an organisation or a series of organisations and their needs. You appeal for volunteers. If you're successful, if you're really successful in that programme, thousands of people come out, or at least hundreds do, and then the organisation, which is a probably a voluntary one, maybe has a, uh, one staff member or something, is swamped, can't cope. And there's a real danger that the voluntary organisation can itself be harmed. What we always do is very carefully visit the regional offices and sometimes local offices of these voluntary organisations just to make sure that the little old lady in the, with the teapot in Randud now is able to cope with the response that her national organiser in London says she can cope with. And um, usually you find that uh, voluntary organisations can cope and they can use volunteers to a far greater degree than people have ever thought before. Henry West appealed to the IBA to stop reports action going national. Why did he feel so strongly about it? Well, we've had some experience with Granada over the time when it was uh, a regional program and a good number of conversations with them about the way it should operate and link into the voluntary organisation, voluntary network. And we felt some doubt about the way in which the preparation work was done. And uh, although we had talked with them, we felt at times that they were not prepared to really listen to us. With some organisations, if you talk to them for six years, there wouldn't be enough time. With some organisations, within six minutes, you can get to somewhere. I think what the problem that we face may be that within many voluntary organisations, their own consultative procedure is poor. Whatever the appeal, whether it's to recruit volunteers or collect old coins to buy kidney machines, the response is always enormous. Report action is watched regularly by nine million people. When it first began, the idea was not to make a cosy sitting down in a flat studio because we tried that regionally, and although we had some success, the sort of reaction was nothing like um, the astonishing reaction we've had uh, to most of, our, most of our items since it went network. 
and that I think is largely due to the market sales pitch of the programme. If we can't get them to do it by sitting down, we'll stand there, we'll talk, we'll scout, we'll hector, we'll criticise, we'll make our own mistakes, but we will actually tell people, you've got to get off your backside and do it. We can't make you do it, you've got to do it yourselves. In Britain today, there are more than 100,000 children who go to school like other youngsters, but who don't go home at night to mum and dad. They live mostly in council homes or in hospitals, and we try to find new families for them. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. But we ask you to consider being a foster parent or adoptive parent for children like those we've shown in this series. When television was first used to find potential parents for children in care, many social workers were highly critical. If you look back to the early days of these kinds of features, we were all worried, very many of us, about whether or not children are going to be damaged by appearing on television. We were worried about how they were going to be exploited by the media. All the kinds of worries that social workers and the press in particular had about this particular type of feature. And so what we have done, I think, is been very careful about trying to ensure that children get a fairly careful preparation for this kind of program. Well, that's a really, um... After lengthy consultation between the Adoption Resource Exchange, Granada, and the Adoption Agency concerned, the program's researcher meets the child and his social worker. Only when the social worker is certain that the child is fully prepared does the filming begin. But, yeah, one of them, how do you get into your job? <laughs> 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 We were posed with the problem of looking for a boy who could really express himself because so many children who've been in care for a long time haven't got good self-expression. They can't, they haven't really come to terms with their history and the problems they've had to face. Certainly, Ted has come to terms with this. He's good verbally and I thought emotionally he could probably take the pressures. Okay, Ted. Whoever is closest to the child will have said beforehand, look, we're trying to find homes for um, children like yourself who've lived in children's homes for most of their life. We hope that perhaps something might happen for you, but nothing may happen for you. It may be a child in a different part of the country who actually finds a family as a result. Well, I've been to Bernardo's about 11 months old. I uh, can't remember much about that. And then years I remember when I was about school. I'm concerned to give a realistic picture of that child, of the good things, of the bad things, of the problems that might be um, that the family might have if they thought in terms of giving that child a home. Did you ever imagine what it might have been like to have your own mum and dad and live at home with them? Yeah, I often you wonder about that the most when you're younger, especially lying in bed and a staff would come and kiss you goodnight and when they walk out the door you'd think you know what it would be like because you, you have a start a different staff nearly every night. Did you feel there was somebody somewhere who was actually looking after you? No. When the film was transmitted six families responded but Ted didn't find a home with any of them. He went into a bed sitter by himself. So how successful is TV home finding? We know that over 200 children have found families as a result of home finding features. Now I don't know how you would define success, but 200 to me says a great deal. Increasingly, broadcasters are finding new ways of reaching their audiences, and the scale of the response they get can be enormous. It's a huge resource waiting to be tapped. What remains to be seen, though, is whether the professionals in the caring business, the churches, the voluntary agencies, and the social services, can adequately meet the challenge.